Before the Flood What was the world like before the flood? In a time that predates our own by millennia, a time so starkly different from today that it might as well belong to another universe. This was the era before the Great Flood, a period not just marked by its ancient landscapes and unimaginable longevity, but defined by its profound spiritual and moral challenges. In this world, humans lived not for mere decades, but for centuries, witnessing and shaping an earth untouched by the vast oceans that now carve our continents. Here, amidst this almost eternal span of life, humanity stood at a precipitous moral crossroads. It was an age where wickedness was not just present, but rampant, where the divine and the earthly interacted in unprecedented ways. Picture giants, true giants, the Nephilim, roaming the vast lands of the earth, their very presence a testament to a bizarre and unnatural union of fallen angels and the daughters of men. Consider the creatures now lost to extinction, animals that once roamed freely across the planet, sharing this ancient world with mankind. This was a time unlike any other, where the supernatural was intertwined with the everyday, and where the actions of a few would determine the fate of many. As we delve into this ancient past today, we are not just recounting history, we are uncovering uh, the Bible filled with lessons that are as relevant in our modern times as they were thousands of years ago. Today, we will explore what it truly meant to live in the days leading up to Noah's flood. We will examine the lives of those who walked the earth when it was filled with corruption and violence, and we will reflect on the nature of righteousness in a time when it was easier to conform to evil than to stand against it. The era before the flood, known as the antediluvian period, unveils a chapter of humanity that is both awe-inspiring and deeply disturbing. It was a time when humans lived lives of astonishing length, witnessing centuries pass, a longevity that defies our current understanding of life's brevity. Scripture gives us brief yet profound glimpses of this period, painting a picture of both immense wickedness and divine grace. But what truly transpired in those distant days? What did it feel like to walk the earth alongside the likes of Adam or Methuselah? And what can we, living thousands of years later, learn from reflecting on this long-lost world. Before continuing with our sermon, we must first address the pre-Adamite race theory. To be clear, I do not endorse, support, or believe in the pre-Adamite race theory. However, I believe it is important to note that there are people who believe in it, and I want you to be aware of what is out there. The view of an antediluvian human existence that predates Adam is sometimes referred to as the pre-Adamic race theory. This theory presents the notion that a group of humans was created by God and inhabited the earth before the biblical Adam was ever created. One of the most notable proponents of a pre-Adamite theory was Isaac Le Peyrère, 1596-1676, a French philosopher and theologian. In his controversial work, Preadamite, published in 1655, he proposed that there were men before Adam who were not descendants of him, suggesting that Adam was merely the ancestor of the Jewish people and not of the entire human race. This was a radical departure from the biblical creation story and was intended to reconcile biblical texts with observable natural evidence and the diversity of peoples known at the time. There are two prominent interpretations of this theory. One is the original proposition by La Perere, and the other is encapsulated in what is known as the gap theory, or the ruin reconstruction model. La Perere suggested that the Gentiles, or non-Jewish people, were the ones created on the sixth day, as recorded in Genesis 1.26, which states, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. La Perere suggested that in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, non-Jewish people were created. He theorized that the Jewish people were not created until after God's day of rest, and that Adam was their progenitor. To strengthen his theory, La Perere pointed to certain biblical events that seemed to imply the existence of other people alongside Adam and his descendants. 
The anxiety of Cain over potential attackers, his union with a wife of unexplained origin, and his establishment of a city, as recounted in Genesis chapter 4 verses 14 to 17, are seen in his opinion as hints of a contemporary human race. Moreover, La Perere examined biblical texts through his unique and quite frankly heretical lens, notably a passage from Romans chapter 5 verses 12 to 14. These verses typically understood to indicate that sin and death entered humanity through Adam and reigned until the Mosaic law was given, were seen by La Perere from a different angle. He believed that pre-Adamite Gentiles had committed transgressions against God's moral will, but not to the severe extent of Adam's sin in the garden which directly violated a direct commandment, eating from the forbidden tree, thereby instituting what La Perere termed the law of paradise. Thus, in his view, these pre-Adamite individuals were those who had not committed an act mirroring Adam's specific transgression. There are a lot of problems with La Perere's interpretations of scripture, and he is not alone. There are plenty of people who interpret scripture in weird, heretical ways. I once watched a video of a man attempting to use the Bible to justify why he should have multiple wives. There are even heretical denominations that teach these teachings. An offshoot of this is the pre-Adamite race theory. The gap theory posits a significant interval between the initial creation of the heavens and the earth, as stated in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, and the earth's subsequent condition of being without form and void in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2. Proponents of this theory state that during this interlude, potentially spanning millions of years, God created a preliminary world full with various life forms, including animals and potentially other beings. This initial creation is hypothesized to have met its end through a cataclysmic event, which some attribute to a rebellion spearheaded by Lucifer, later known as Satan. Such a rebellion and the ensuing divine judgment are theorized to have brought about the utter ruin and desolation of this world, rendering the earth formless and void, which is the state described at the beginning of Genesis chapter 1 verse 2. According to the gap theory, the narrative from Genesis chapter 1 verse 3 onward describes not the initial act of creation, but rather a process of divine restoration or recreation. This second act of creation culminates with the fashioning of Adam and Eve and the establishment of the world as it was known from that point forward. The Bible does not speak of a pre-Adamite race. Therefore, you and I should not subscribe to the belief in a pre-Adamite race. Stick to the Bible. Stick to what is written in the Bible and not to the imagination of people. Now, let us focus on what we do know about the antediluvian period. In the early chapters of Genesis, we are provided a captivating portrait of a world vastly different from our own. A world where heavenly beings interacted with humanity and took the daughters of men as wives, producing offspring of great stature and prowess, and where the collective soul of mankind swayed heavily towards corruption and violence. To understand the cataclysmic event of the flood, we first must understand the climate, both physical and spiritual, of the antediluvian world. Genesis chapter 6 verses 1 to 5 gives us a brief but profoundly mysterious account. The sons of God, often interpreted as fallen angels or celestial beings, saw the daughters of men and took them as wives. The result of these unnatural unions was the Nephilim, described as heroes of old, men of renown. These weren't just influential figures of ancient tales, but rather they were beings of significant size and, presumably, of unusual strength and capability. The term Nephilim is often translated as giants, painting a picture of these beings as towering figures, possibly possessing abilities beyond that of ordinary men. So it is important to note that the sons of God are not the Nephilim, and the Nephilim are not angels. This is a very important distinction to keep in mind. The Nephilim are the product of the union of fallen angels with human women. This boggles the minds of many people. They question how a spirit being like an angel, can produce a material being, a Nephilim. But if you think about it, everything that you know and that I know was created by an invisible, eternal being, God Almighty. The sons of God who formed a union with women in Genesis 6 were angels. These angels left their positions in heaven to commit immorality on earth. The angels in Genesis 6 are probably whom Jude was referring to in Jude chapter 1 verse 6 
and the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. But the presence of the Nephilim and the actions of the fallen angels were just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the moral degradation of the antediluvian world. As we navigate deeper into the scripture, the narrative paints a bleak scene of the human heart's capacity for wickedness. Genesis chapter 6 verse 5 states, The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. This description is chilling. Every thought, every inclination, entirely consumed by evil all the time. What might this unyielding wickedness have looked like in practice? Can you imagine a world like this? A world so full of darkness and wickedness. A world so full of corruption and the love of evil. It's conceivable that the society was plagued with greed, lust, deceit, and betrayal. Violence, as scripture specifically points out, was rampant. The heart's core fabric had become so tainted that acts of cruelty, injustice, and malice were likely commonplace. The very essence of humanity's moral compass had been distorted to an extent where God's original design and intent for humanity seemed almost entirely obscured. In Noah's generation, wickedness reached a peak that the Bible describes as unprecedented. Why was this the case? One reason could be the remarkable longevity of human life at that time. People weren't living just for a few decades. They were living for centuries. Imagine the impact on a society where individuals, if they chose a path of wickedness, continued in that path for hundreds of years. Unlike today, where a person might spread evil for, say, 70 years in Noah's time, someone could spread that evil for 500 years or more. Moreover, as previously stated, this is the same time period we're fallen. Angels took daughters of men as wives, leading to the birth of the Nephilim, a hybrid offspring. These beings could have brought a different, more potent form of wickedness or influenced humanity in ways we can't fully understand. Their presence, combined with humans who lived long and perhaps continued in their sinful ways without change, created a world saturated with evil. Thus, it wasn't just the longevity of life, but the compounded effects of prolonged wickedness and the potential influence of supernatural beings that made the world so corrupt in days before the flood. The gravity of humanity's wickedness during this time cannot be overstated. It reached a point where God felt sorrow that he had made man on the earth. Imagine the depth of corruption required to grieve the heart of the Creator to such an extent. Yet, amidst the overwhelming darkness of this era, the narrative does not leave us without hope. While the world at large chose a path of corruption, individuals like Noah found favor in God's eyes. It serves as a poignant reminder that even in the most depraved times, righteousness can still stand firm, and God's grace remains available. In reflecting on the world before the flood, we gain insight into the depths to which humanity can sink when distanced from God. It serves as a cautionary tale and beckons us to seek God's presence in our lives today, lest we forget our true purpose and destiny. In the time leading up to the Great Flood, the Bible describes a world that, in many ways, defies our modern understanding. One of the most striking features of the antediluvian age was the extraordinary longevity of human life. People didn't just live for a century, they lived for multiple centuries, and while this might at first seem like a mere footnote in the grander narrative, the implications of these extended lifespans are profound, both spiritually and societally. Consider Methuselah, a name many are familiar with, even if just for the fact that he holds the record for the longest human lifespan in the Bible, a staggering 969 years. But there's much more to his story than just an impressive age. The name Methuselah is rich in meaning. While scholars have debated the precise interpretation of his name, one proposed meaning is, his death shall bring, suggesting that upon his death, something significant would occur. As the timeline unfolds, Methuselah's death appears to coincide with the onset of the Great Flood, implying that his lifespan was a divinely appointed time frame leading up to that pivotal event. Now imagine the implications of such extended lifespans. On a spiritual level, people like Methuselah would have been living testimonies to earlier times. This means that the stories of creation, the Garden of Eden, and humanity's early interactions with God could have been passed down directly from the source, not as distant legends, but as first-hand accounts. 
the echoes of God's original intentions for humanity and the gravity of the fall would have been very much alive in that day. From a societal perspective, the stability provided by such long lives could have had both positive and negative effects. On the one hand, accumulated wisdom from centuries of living would be directly accessible. Elders wouldn't just be those who had lived 70 or 80 years, but hundreds of years, with experiences and insights spanning multiple generations. Families would grow under the guidance of patriarchs and matriarchs who had seen and learned much. On the other hand, if someone were set in wicked ways, their influence could persist much longer, potentially leading entire clans or communities down paths of rebellion against God. On a practical level, the dynamics of family, relationships, and skill acquisition would be vastly different. Relationships would have layers we can't fully fathom today. How would you relate to your great-great-great-grandchildren, and they to you, if you were all contemporaries, and consider the crafts, arts, and skills one could master in hundreds of years, expertise would take on a whole new dimension. However, with all the potential advantages of such long life, the Bible paints a picture not of a utopia, but rather of a world in serious moral decline. Despite the direct access to wisdom and first-hand accounts of divine encounters, humanity, by and large, drifted away from God. In reflecting on this era, Methuselah stands as a beacon. His life, marked by its incredible duration and the significance of his name, serves as a testament to God's patience, his intricate plans, and his messages that sometimes span centuries. In the end, it wasn't the number of years lived that mattered most, but the state of the heart and one's alignment with God's will. As we consider the world before the flood, let us be reminded that life, whether short or long, is an opportunity to align with God's purposes and to treasure our days in accordance with His will. Now let's focus on the landscape and the atmosphere of the world during this time. The Bible paints vivid pictures of humanity's behavior and God's interactions with mankind during this period, but it provides less detail about the physical conditions of the earth itself. However, through a combination of scripture, scientific hypotheses, and historical conjectures, some have developed theories about the landscape and climate of the antediluvian world. Please note these are theories and are not stated explicitly in scripture. Let's tread carefully, recognizing that while these ideas offer intriguing possibilities, they remain speculative and are not explicitly detailed in scripture. One of the more compelling theories concerns the atmospheric conditions of the pre-flood earth. Some suggest that the earth's atmosphere might have been significantly different potentially contributing to the extended lifespans mentioned in Genesis. Another captivating theory revolves around the Earth's geography. Today, we have our continents separated by vast oceans. But was the world always this way? Some speculate the existence of a single supercontinent during the antediluvian era. This idea isn't only based on biblical considerations, but also stems from the scientific theory of plate tectonics, suggesting that our continents once fit together in a giant landmass known as Pangaea. Integrating this with the biblical narrative, some propose that this supercontinent began to break apart either during or shortly after the flood, forever changing the landscape of our planet. Such a seismic reshaping might align with the catastrophic nature of the flood, which was more than just a heavy rainstorm, but a complete overhaul of the earth as humanity knew it. Considering these theories gives us a potential backdrop against which the early chapters of Genesis played out. Imagine a world with a single, vast landmass, enveloped in a climate that was uniformly warm, stable, and possibly teeming with vegetation and life. Such conditions would shape the daily experiences, challenges, and opportunities of early humanity in ways we can only begin to fathom.